ladies and gentlemen, to all my green section in the room today, as well as red and blue who are with me virtually via the magic of YouTube and video technology. Um, my apologies for not getting the video out on time. Unfortunately, uh, I recorded about two hours of video without any sound and even came on campus this weekend trying to get things done. It didn't work out, so I'm reprising, remaking this video for everyone so that if, in case you miss anything, you've got it. Um, I've got a live studio audience in, in, in class today, so you guys can make yourself heard. Um, it's just going to be you and me for the next 30 minutes. You ready? Let's do this. Um, first off, a couple of things I want to make sure that everybody is aware of. Um, there are three major topics I want to talk about today. The first one is potential energy. Um, you probably know by now, by going through the uh, PYP program, that there's a lot of different varieties and forms of energy in the world around us. For example, if you got here today driving in your car, your car was able to convert the chemical energy stored in the gas or petroleum into um, a kinetic energy to move the pistons up and down in your engine, turning those wheels, and you got here that way. Unless, of course, you happen to have one of those fancy, schmancy, new um, e electric, voltaic, or EV cars, um, which means you probably plugged it into a wall and downloaded lots of electrical energy into a stored battery, Maybe you've got one of those um, houses that has solar panels on top, so the energy came from the sun, converted itself into electricity, stored itself in the batteries. That's also still a conversion of what we would consider light energy coming from the sun, converted into electrical energy or chemical energies as it's being stored into your battery, then converted again. Ooh. As you know, in your rover, you need to have potential energy that can be stored. A lot of students have been asking me, how is this going to happen? And so therefore, I want to give you a quick show and showcase. Here we go. Um, just so you know, everybody is going to be receiving two of these. These are legal size rubber bands. Boing, boing, boing. Um, you're going to be getting two of these, or more if you need. Um, just this weekend, I got my shipment in from Amazon, and I got lots of them. So um, everybody will be getting two of these from me, as well as you'll be getting as many popsicle sticks as you need. And I'm going to be making sure that everybody gets at least two of these. These are dowels. Maybe you'll use yours for uh, your axles. Turns out that each of these dowels is exactly 12 inches long, but it also happens to be one quarter of an inch in, in diameter. Is that true? Let's take the time to measure this out make sure that we're all correct. If I were to measure this using a ruler and take a look at the um, what we would consider imperial measurements, it's exactly one quarter of an inch in diameter. If I were to measure this using metric measurements, it's just a little bit over five millimeters. I'd say just around six millimeters in diameter. And by the way, by diameter, I'm talking about how um, how wide the axle is from one edge to the other edge if you drove the circle straight through the metal. Anyways, um, the reason why I bring up the rubber band is because rubber bands are made out of a variety of different materials. Um, sometimes they're made out of rubber, hence rubber bands. Um, sometimes they're made out of latex, sometimes they're made out of all kinds of different materials. But what they have is they have this elastic ability, which means they're stretchy. When you put some potential energy stored in there by stretching out the rubber band, if you were to let it go, you'd see that it wants to return to its <laughs> neutral shape. And so, therefore, it will cause all that potential energy to convert to kinetic energy and revert back to its original shape. I share this with you because a number of people have been asking me, how are we going to use that potential energy as kinetic energy? Well, here's an example of a rover. It's just a a basic rover. The chassis is made out of a cardboard box. It's got um, some really super crazy thick dowels as axles, and you can see that the wheels are made out of CDs or DVDs, used ones. Well, yeah, young, mine, and ours. I have no idea what that is. Ooh, while you were sleeping. Anyways, that was... Anyways, if you were to take a look at this particular rover design, you would see that there are a couple of different features that this rover has. For example, anchored 
in the front of this rover happens to be a hook, like a hook that you would use for hanging things at home. And driven into the middle of the axle, the back axle, there is a nail there. The nail in the hook is going to allow us to connect this rubber band to both the chassis and to the axle. So as you can see, I've connected the rubber band to the chassis and I've stretched it and connected it to the axle. And you'll notice when I start to then turn the axle, you'll see that the rubber band begins to stretch, storing a bunch of potential energy. And if I were then to let go of this, it would attempt to return back to its natural shape, its neutral state, and it would release all the potential energy that's stored in its elastic state and convert it back into kinetic energy and therefore it would take the axle and spin it in the opposite direction of which that I had turned it and it would therefore, because my wheels are connected to my axles, turn my wheels as well. And that's just a very simple demonstration. Now if I were to take this and do the same thing over again, and start to stretch it, and stretch it, and stretch it, and stretch it, and stretch it. Notice my wheels are going this way. What's going to happen when I let go? It's going to move. They're going to go in the opposite direction. So in theory, I should be able to set this down, and it rolls across the floor, right? Okay? Now, how far did that go? Well, you can't see it on the camera, but I'd say it probably went just about three meters, just about ten feet. Three meters! Sound familiar? Uh, yeah. yeah, three meters is actually the same exact distance that you would need to go if you were starting at your research site, uh, at the, the original landing site, and trying to get to research site delta. That's three meters in distance. However, it's two decimeters in elevation. So that didn't go up a hill, but your, your rover eventually would need to. Now that was a fairly efficient rover design. Um, some basic simple parts, did its job. It didn't go very fast, it didn't go very far, but it did what it needed to do. However, it wasn't storing any of our scientific equipment. So these are things that you need to think about as you're designing your final rover design. So that's our potential energy. Any questions? Are there other resources that you could use to store that potential energy and not use our rubber bands? Sure, you could use springs. In fact, people have been using springs to store potential energy for centuries. Um, and they're really useful tools. They're also kind of difficult to work with, but very powerful. In fact, there are competitions um, that are held every year for college-level engineering students where they make spring-loaded cars to try and see if they can get them to go really long distances. And the mechanisms that they use are actually mouse traps. I've had students make their Mars rovers out of mouse traps before, and I've also seen students snap their fingers in those mouse traps accidentally. So I'm giving you the rubber bands. You can choose if you want to use them or use another additional source of potential mouse energy. Traps. Yeah. Let's talk mechanical advantage. Okay? So if you're taking notes, you can start a new line mechanical advantage. Mechanical advantage is an incredibly important concept to understand. Mechanical advantage simply means the advantage that the machine gives us. We use machines to do work. And by work, I don't mean like, I'm going to go to work today, jerk a cup of coffee and do some tapping on the keyboard. I mean moving things from one place to another. Our species has used machines to our advantage over the centuries to create some amazing architectural monuments. If you think about the pyramids and the massive, super crazy, heavy blocks that needed to get from one place to another, we used all kinds of different simple machines to build those massive structures. Specifically, we used logs, which were the wheel and axle all together. We put the massive slabs of block on them and rolled them, but those machines were super helpful for us. Also, to get them up, the, up to the very top of the pyramid, we would use inclined planes, which helps cut down the amount of work we would need to do. I'm not going to go into every single simple machine because you have actually spent plenty of time in the PYP program or other science classrooms in the past learning about simple machines. Just know that we rate machines. We can compare machines against each other to say this machine is better at doing work than this machine 
by looking at the mechanical advantage that they give us, the advantage that each machine gives us. Because we are making rovers, or technically vehicles, we're going to be specifically focusing on the wheel and axle and how you calculate the mechanical advantage of the wheel and axle. It's actually pretty straightforward. Um, but first, before you can understand that, you've got to know some simple information about your wheels and your axles, specifically what the radius of your wheel and axle is. So, let's do a little bit of a review for math class if you haven't done this recently. This is a circle. Most wheels are circles. And each circle has about three pieces of information about it that's going to be useful and helpful to us. For example, if you were to have a perfect circle with a spot directly in the center, and you're going to draw a line from the very center of that spot to the very outside edge of that circle, you would have what is called the radius. Okay, I've spelled it for you right here just in case you need to know how to spell it properly. If you were to double that radius, or if you were to cut that circle straight down the very center from edge to edge, you would end up with something called the diameter. Right? The diameter happens to be twice as long as your radius. And the amount of distance or space around the outside of the circle is what is called the circumference. I've had many times in the past my computer tell me that I've spelled it wrong because I keep spelling it circum. France, F-R-A-N-C-E, but it's not spelled that way. So just be aware. Now, if you have any of these pieces of information, you can determine the other two. Because every single circle that's out there has a very special piece of information embedded in it that you may be aware of. And we use that piece of information called pi to help us to determine other pieces of information about the circle that we may not know. If you want to find out, for example, what the circumference or the area around the circle to see how big that circle is, all you need to know is one other piece of information, for example, the diameter or the radius, and you can figure out the rest. For us and for our purpose, the radius is a key piece of information that we need to be aware of. So, if you know the radius of your circle, you can easily double that to get your diameter, or you can actually um, find out the circumference by doing a very simple mathematical equation. You may or may not want to write this down. It may become an important thing to you later on as we continue to determine how effective our rovers are. That equation is this. The circumference is equal to 2 times pi times radius. So, for example, 2 times pi, and pi is always 3.14, although I don't doubt there are a number of people in this particular class who can tell us what pi is to the umpteenth place, 3.14... 1, 9, 5, 9, 6, 6. Yeah, there are contests where people try and memorize the, the, the length of pi out to the hundredth value. Turns out it's, it's a number that can never actually be finite. But anyways, in order to figure out the circumference of a circle, we need to multiply it 2 times 3.14 times the radius. And to determine the radius is actually pretty simple. If you've got a circle, you can just get a ruler, you can draw a perfect dot in the center and measure out to the outside. I'm actually going to show you four circles that I have with me today that I have already pre-measured. For example, I've got this really tiny one here. It is 1.5 um, uh, centimeters radius. I've got one twice the size of that at uh, 3 centimeters, the radius. I've got one three times the size of that at nine centimeters radius. And finally, I've got my big bad wheel that's got a radius of six centimeters. I'm showing you this because I want you to be able to see and calculate the difference between these circles. So you can find out what the circumference is. Notice, with my tiny, tiny, tiny circle, I already know that my radius is 1.5 centimeters. So if I were to plug that into my calculation, it would be 2 times 3.14 times 1.5 equals 9 point what? 9.42. Did you just figure that out? Yeah, I can't. You just did the math. Yeah. Yes, this is math. Get in math. Yeah. Okay. I didn't. Now, guys and girls, if we were to then take this and multiply that honestly by 2, because 1.5 times 3, this is going to become. 18.84, right? Now, 
if we were to do this number, is 2 times 3.14 times 6. 2 times 3.14 times 6 is 37.68. Is that correct? No. Okay, good. Now, why is this important to us? Well, as it turns out, for each of these circles, their circumference is important. You'll notice on each of these circles, I have not just drawn the measurements, but I've also put a little black line on it. Same thing with this one too, you'll see the black line there. Imagine that both of these circles happen to have the same axle attached to it. The same axle that has the same diameter, same radius. Now, imagine my axle turns once, causing this particular circle to also turn once. Imagine that same axle, turns once, causing this circle to also turn once. The difference between these two circles is not just how big they are, but it's how much distance one complete revolution of that circle is going to get them. For example, we know that the circumference of this tiny, tiny circle is 9.42, which means every time this circle rotates one complete revolution, along with the one complete revolution of my axle, it's going to go exactly nine centimeters. So, therefore, if I were then to get my axle to rotate ten times, my rover wheel would also rotate ten times and it would go a total distance of about 90 centimeters. But then, if I was able to get that same axle to rotate ten times with this size of this wheel on it, could you imagine ten times the distance? It would be 376 centimeters. Now, that's over three meters. Think about it. Because one meter is 100 centimeters. So that would be over three meters if I used a circle just about this size. Now, imagine if I were to take this circle. Oh, there's my over. And compare it to the size of this CD. You'd notice my CDs are just about the same size. Coincidence? I think not. Now, why are we having this conversation? I've told you how to calculate the circumference of your wheel, and that's great because it's going to give you more distance. But what you really need to understand is, is that at the root of all this is what we call mechanical advantage. The wheel and axle provides us an advantage. That machine gives us an advantage. It helps us to move a heavy weight or our scientific equipment from one place to another. It reduces the amount of effort that we have to put in to get the work to happen. So let me show you how to calculate mechanical advantage, at least for the wheel and axle. Turns out to do that, you're going to need to know the circumference of your wheel and the circumference of your axle. And if you divide the circumference of your wheel by the circumference of your axle, you'll get the mechanical advantage score. So let's just say, for example, let's say I had a wheel that happened to have a radius of 4 centimeters. And I happen to have an axle that had a radius of 1 centimeter. Well, I would be able to do the mechanical advantage. Wait, did I say circumference? No, I don't want circumference. Fix that. It's the radius of the wheel and the radius of the axle. My apologies. The radius. You'd probably radius. get the same mechanical advantage if you had used the diameter, but we're sticking with radius. So we're going to look at the radius of our wheel, radius of our axle. So if we take a look at a wheel that has a radius of 4 centimeters attached to an axle that has a radius of 1 centimeter, we're going to take that 4 centimeters, and we're going to divide it by the 1 centimeters. That's going to give us a mechanical advantage of 4. It's a pretty decent machine. What then, if we had that same axle that's exactly 1 centimeter in diameter, but we attached it to a wheel that is 6 centimeters? Uh, not in diameter, uh, 6 centimeter radius wheel. Well, our mechanical advantage of this would be our six centimeter radius wheel over our one centimeter radius 
axle, and that's going to give us a mechanical advantage of six. Which of these two wheels and axle pairings gives us the most advantage? Which is going to allow us to put in the least amount of effort, but to get the most work out of it? In this case, the most distance. Well, it's the larger wheel. Now, depending on the size of the wheel and axle relationship, that can make a big difference. For example, I have three different axle sizes here. One, which is the axle size that all of you are going to be getting, paired with the axle size that's about the same diameter of a pencil, and then one that's about that big. Look at the difference. Are any of these inherently better or worse than the others? Not necessarily. It really depends on how big the wheel is that's attached to them. For example, there is an inherent disadvantage to the strength of the three of these. This particular axle is really thick, which means it's going to be really strong. You could put a lot of pressure on this before it would break. More pressure than I could put on it, right? But because of the thickness or the size of that radius, it's not going to give you as good of a mechanical advantage. And this particular one, depending on how much pressure you put on the center of that when you attach your rubber bands to it, it could, in theory, potentially snap. So you've got to consider the materials or the makeup of your, your, of your um, particular materials in that. Now, you know how big your wheels are, you know how big your... Um, the, the, the radius of your axles are, you can, con uh, you can calculate your mechanical advantage. Great. So now we know how potential energy is going to work. Now we know how mechanical advantage is going to work. You can use both of, of that piece of information to help you craft a rover that's going to be more effective. All right. Last thing that we need to talk about in our test today is orthographic projections. So for this, you're going to need your graph paper. Okay, so go ahead and get your graph paper out and we'll get started.